Oh, yeah. All right, here we are in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Get down to that verse. Remember that you Gentiles were at that time apart from Christ, having been alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the verse we left off here. The commentary is that Paul goes on to write in Ephesians 2.12 that the Gentile believers whom Paul is addressing in his letter were formerly apart from Christ in a personal sense before they became believers. And likewise, as a part of the group of Gentiles before they became believers, they as a group of people formerly had no revelation of a national hope of a Messiah to bless them in a temporal sense or save them in an eternal sense as Israel had available to her through the covenants as symbolized by circumcision. Furthermore, the Gentiles were formerly alienated from the commonwealth, the state and people of Israel, in the sense of being alienated and excluded from community, fellowship, and citizenship with God's chosen people Israel, and all that that entails, especially relevant to God's covenants with his chosen people, which included blessings for all the peoples of the earth. Salvation is the same for all. Thus the Gentiles were strangers to the covenants of the promise to the world through Israel of a Savior, Jesus Christ, to come through the seed of Abraham. And thus formerly the Gentiles had no hope of temporal blessing or eternal salvation through any other means but through God's chosen people Israel, which to them was no hope at all, especially in light of the ungodly contempt that the Jews held for all non-Jews, unless they became proselytes, proselytes, which few did in the light of the segregated circumstances. Note that in the Old Testament times, even Gentile believers were largely ostracized and excluded from fellowship in the temple of God in Jerusalem and in local synagogues by Jews, even those Jews who were of the faith of Abraham, despite the Gentiles' faith. So the Gentiles were deprived of direct participation in God's covenants and thus had no message of hope, nor of God's revelation to them of future eternal glory, nor of temporal blessings as Israel had through the covenants. Unlike Israel, they were given no special revelation to them by God of an expectation of a personal Messiah, Savior, and Deliverer to whom a moment of faith resulted even for them in eternal life in the eternal kingdom, the Messianic age. Finally, Paul writes at the end of Ephesians 2.12 that the Gentiles formerly were without God in the sense of not being given the revelation that the Israelites were given, and they, by and large, were willfully ignorant of him. They were alienated from the revelation that God gave Israel so that they were strangers to the covenants. Hence, they did not believe in the one true God. They were without God in the world until the age when Paul became an apostle, an age about which Paul wrote to Gentiles and defined by the phrase, the mystery of Christ. This subject will be dealt with in greater detail in chapter 3. We look at Ephesians 3, 1 to 7, get an inkling of that. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of your Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body of Christ and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which is given to me according to the working of his power. Now we go to verse 2.13. And now, you Gentile believers in Christ Jesus, you being once afar off, estranged from God, <clears throat> become near to God by the blood of the of the Christ. We look at that verse. And now in Christ Jesus, you being once afar off, become near by the blood of Christ. And now referring to the Gentile believers standing with God at the time of Paul's ministry, they are in Christ Jesus in the sense of being part of God, Christ's body, a spiritual position of functioning within the capacity that Christ Jesus had provided for them.
new creation in Christ. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.17 corroborates this. You can click on that and read a little bit. The phrase in 2.13 rendered, And now in Christ Jesus, you being once afar so off, became near by the blood of Christ. The words rendered far away and near are used in the Hebrew language to describe the position of Gentiles and Jews, not only in a geographic sense, but in a spiritual sense of being near or far off from God. The original reference had to do with Jews and Gentiles and how they were geographically located relative to their distance from Jerusalem as well as their relative spiritual distances from God. Take a look at Isaiah 57, 1 to 2, and 19 to 21. The righteous perishes, and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness, creating the praise of the lips. Peace be, peace, peace be to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So the reference, the phrase rendered peace to him in Isaiah 57, 19 refers to the righteous man, verses 1 and 2. The righteous man who is near and the one who is far off, those who will receive eternal peace because they have been declared by God as righteous. Other passages indicate that this declaration is as a result of a moment of faith alone and God's provision of eternal life through his Son alone, Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. So Gentile and Jewish believers are in Christ Jesus as stipulated in the previous passage in Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians 1, 22 to 23. And he put all things in subjection to, under his feet and gave himself as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who is filling all things in all ways. So God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be head over all things the universe including the church. Furthermore, God gave Christ to the church, both Jew and Gentile believer, over which he is head and which he is his body. And the fullness of him who Christ is filling, Greek participle, all things, the universe, the church, in all ways with power. So believers in this age will be part of the body of Christ and have the fullness of Christ in them being constantly filled by him, by his power, this is not saying that Christ is made complete by the church as being filled up with him, as some contend. Rather, it is the church who has become the fullness of him, in the sense of that their entire substance and subsistence is from Christ alone, as some contend, for Christ is God, who by nature is complete and needs no filling. So in Ephesians 2.13, the phrase rendered by the blood of Christ indicates that it was by a moment of faith alone in Christ Jesus alone, for eternal life, the shedding of his blood for sins. You can click on this, and there is some discussion about blood, the biblical perspective. Oops. And we'll talk about this more next time.